Cristiano Fugazza, thank you. And uh, about the, the Ritmare and uh, uh, some experience about the Ritmare SDI. Thank you. Good afternoon, I already presented myself this morning. Anyway, my name is Cristiano Fugazza. I work by the National Research Council of Italy, specifically in Milan, by the Institute for Electromagnetic Sensing of the Environment. Perhaps a little misleading with respect to the topic of my talk today, which is uh, spatial data infrastructures. In Europe, we are regulated by the INSPIRE Directive, a set of uh, a recipe, a set of recipes for interoperability that have some foundations on standards. In this process, uh, we can uh, distinguish between uh, two different levels of interoperability. A first level, a protocol level interoperability that is elicited by the shared set of services uh, created by OGC and the second level of content level interoperability that is elicited by the shell set of data and metadata models. <laughs> by talking uh, of Thesauri this morning with you, we are working on a further level of interoperability, which is semantic interoperability. That is something we wanted to achieve uh, developing the Inspire infrastructure, that is the, the sorry, the Ritmar infrastructure, which is a flagship project of the CNR. We are in charge of creating the SDI, putting together all the distinct contributions to this project. Essentially, acquiring this third level of interoperability amounts to executing semantic lift on metadata. That is, in the metadata, you typically find the string representations of keywords, of people, places, uh, uh, observed properties, and so on. We want to substitute these strings with URIs, with unique identifiers that can point to a formal description of the entities involved. The expected result is an easier inclusion of geospatial metadata into the web of data. Specifically, the large cloud you can see in the top left corner of, uh, of the slide, which is a representation, an automatic generated representation of the different contributions to the semantic web. Given the magnitude and the variety of this cloud, it is apparent that Thesauri do not constitute the fabric of the semantic web. But uh, in the limited uh, domain of geospatial information, I can see that uh, Thesauri, especially in multilingua Thesauri, can constitute the weave of such fabric. And metadata is the weft, because the metadata can mention these uh, URIs, and so you can find, you can elicit novel um, discovery techniques by using these uh, representations. Also, Thesauri allow to set the specific terminology that is used by given community of practice, which is important for any project. Let's see how we try to achieve this in Ritmar. Okay. In Ritmare, we have 31 institutions for a grand total of more than 1,000 researchers that are uh, coming from 12 different research domains. Most of these domains come with pre-existing practices um, that uh, need to be taken into account where integrating their product. Also, these data providers have different degrees of maturity with respect to the provisioning of data and metadata according to the standards. Since uh, capacity building is a big topic in Ritmare, we decided to provide an application which is available as free and open source software 
as a virtual machine, but you can uh, install it from scratch if you want, and provide these to um, data providers. Spatial data infrastructures can be divided into centralized and decentralized. In Ritmare, we opted for the second choice because we want the data providers to retain full control over the data and metadata they are providing. Also, we wanted to um, allow for pre-existing infrastructure to continue functioning. So, the Ritmare infrastructure is made of different nodes, most of them using our software tools, which is called GetIt, acronym of Geo Information Enabling Toolkit, that bundles a number of software. First, we have GeoNode, which is a software for geographic information, for providing data and metadata. It provides a, or an all-round workflow for the provision of this information, even if uh, metadata management is a little bit sloppy. And this is why we provided our own metadata editor and our own metadata practices. Then we bundle the SOS, Sensor Observation Service Client by 52 North, which is something that is not, uh, does not exist in uh, current uh, applications of this kind. Then we provide EDI, which is a metadata editor that is capable of uh, integrating metadata <laughs> with uh, the semantic web. God bless you. <laughs> and then we also provided our own SOS client uh, in order to mix and match sensor observations, geographic information, and so on. Data and metadata are stored locally, and by the central catalog of Ritmare, metadata is harvested according to RDF, the lingua franca of the semantic web we've been seeing uh, this morning. Okay. So the centralized catalog can act as a single point of access to the resources made available by all participants to Project Ritmare. All these tools either are available as, f as free and open source software or have been developed from scratch by us and made available according to the same licenses. EDI is a metadata editor. EDI is the name of Gyros Helper, which is the anthropomorphic light bulb in Walt Disney Comics. It's just uh, a meta language. You cannot see it by looking at uh, this web form. But we defined a meta language because uh, in Ritmare we had uh, to provide metadata according to the basic Inspire profile, according to the Italian uh, version of Inspire, which is our NDT, the repository of National Geographic uh, data. We also needed to provide valid sensor ML metadata for inclusion in the software by 52 North, version 1.0, and we knew that version 2.0 was underway. So we needed to be extremely flexible in defining which metadata we, we shall provide. So we created a meta language, an XML language that allows system administrators to say exactly which fields shall be created when creating metadata. For an example, as an example, the uh, point of contact, the details of the point of contact you see in the slide are not inserted by hand, but are auto-completed by the application on the basis of context information we have been translating into RDF and made available as a sparkle endpoint. We will see how these uh, can uh, be used to uh, include thesauri and all resources made available on the semantic web into metadata editing. Now please hold fast because this is the point where my boss says that I get too complicated for the audience. But uh, I swear it is a little for counterpoint. It's uh, just uh, to show you to which extent uh, m mapping geospatial uh, metadata with the semantic to the semantic web can be kept uh, transparent to the end user, as you can see in this slide. The meta language we created is an XML 
schema. You can see it in white. One of the things that we can do with our meta language is defining data sources. For instance, uh, these data sources, al also with a mistake here that Alexander can recognize, this data source allows the editor to directly look up the data structures in the BODC servers. It is quite straightforward for uh, technically savvy people to write this uh, Sparkle query language, which is the language used to query RDF, and expect results. We have two variables, question mark C and question mark L. C is the URI of a concept, a term in a thesaurus, and L is the label, the text representation that shall be inserted into metadata. Line eight requires this term to come from vocabulary P07. Because for instance, if you're managing uh, radar data, you possibly need to comply with uh, a code list named the climate and forecast standard names. Rather than allowing the user to just uh, type it in the metadata with errors, mistakes, and so on, we directly extract it from a formal representation hosted by CDATANET. Then the next line extracts the labels that are associated with this concept and then line eight matches this label with the text that is entered by the user at metadata creation time. On line 15, you can see the endpoint to which this query shall be issued. So you can access an heterogeneous set of information on the web. But once we leave Geekland, for the more comfortable world of uh, web-based applications, the user just have to start writing the keyword he wants and be suggested all the matches in the standard vocabulary. Then, upon selection of a term, the text representation is inserted into metadata. But the important part, the URI, remember the question mark C variable in the preceding slide is saved and used to create a semantically uh, rich metadata that is stored by the central repository of Rekmare. Let's give another example that is not grounded on thesauri. For instance, this query just looks for people. The name of people the email of peoples, and the website of the organizations the people work for. We have two variables, one for the email, one for the website of the institution. We want dollar search underscore param, which is the value entered by the user, to match the email of the user. Then, sorry, is not the text entered by the user, but the value of this uh, uh, metadata element, uh, which is the URI of the person that is selected. Once uh, selected, you take the email and the website and return it to the editor that is able to insert it in metadata. For structuring people and organizations in Ritmare, we use a friend of a friend, FOF uh, data schema. So, in principle, any data structure, any ontology that is expressed as RDF and made available as a Sparkle endpoint can be plugged in our tool. The result of this is a web form where you can start typing the name of the point of contact and the query, once triggered, automatically fills in the accessory information that is required to provide valid Inspire metadata. Okay. Now, resuming what I've been saying, metadata has an important role in providing interoperability of spatial data infrastructures. 
we have seen that controlled vocabularies and thesauri has even a more important role because they allow to set the terminology used by community of practice. Our tool allows to plug in all these possible resources made available on the web of data into the metadata editing application. Our tools are free to use, free to download. We can provide support for it. You can find it uh, on GitHub. Both the whole um, Get It suite and also the AD editor that can be used standalone in order to be customized to your own metadata profile, to your own data sources, and so on. Last but not least, if they accept our abstract, you can meet us in Barcelona by the Inspire conference where we will provide some more details and a hands-on experience on configuring, customizing, and uh, plugging in external data structures into the editing, uh, our metadata editing application. Everything is free and open source and available at Creative Commons uh, license. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Cristiano. Questions? Yeah, questions. I, I, I don't have a comment because I know very well the, this, this part. But please, comment, question. Sorry. Okay. Uh, at first, I liked very much your HTML presentation. <laughs> I liked your HTML presentation. It's an HTML presentation, right? It's not a PowerPoint. It's not a PowerPoint. I know an expert on it, but I have no idea how to do it. So, uh, what exactly does a discovery client does? Does it use uh, predefined queries in order to discover? Uh, you had in, the, in your architecture schema and the design, you had an, a discovery client. Yeah. How does it work? No, in the centralized portal. We are still developing the centralized uh, node of Ritmare, but uh, our idea is implementing a Google-like uh, query facility. I mean that uh, you should be able to say, for instance, I want uh, water temperature 100 kilometers west of Naples. And uh, the, the engine should uh, look up the individual terms of this query that can be um, found in thesauri, control vocabularies, and so on. For instance, Naples can be found in geonames, providing also the um, coordinates of the town. Then you can compute where going 100 kilometers west of Naples you will be. You can uh, then create a bounding box, uh, and this is some sort of heuristics, but. Uh, we cannot do uh, anything else. Similarly, you can find water temperature in many vocabularies. And so you have all the elements to browse in the RDF metadata that is stored. You can also, you will also be able to look for something annotated in English by using Italian because thesauri are multilingual, for instance. You can do query expansion. You can do a lot of things on the basis of the URIs that are related to metadata. This is uh, the first case of uh, um, semantic translation of inspired metadata into RDF, to my knowledge. I knew that I was going too technical. So, Cristiano, um, 
you've chosen to represent users or manufacturers through the through a vocabulary that you've created in, and it's written like uh, with fourth through the fourth ontology the fourth data schema is widely acknowledged you have more that you can add to both if you want, for instance, to specify the address of an institute of a person and so on. So we just uh, took a long Excel sheet with uh, all the names and emails and affiliations of people in Ritmare, parsed it with XSLT and turned it into both. ID is a very important role because uh, we don't want uh, to mess with uh, user uh, registration, user authentication, and so on. Then, since all people from CNR are required to have an ORCID, then we will allow people on the centralized portal to log in using his ORCID. Also, the information that ORCID could provide as RDF may be interesting for other purposes. But currently, um, the ORCID people um, are not publishing uh, RDF data. They were publishing it uh, last year, yeah. then they stopped then they because uh, they are coming up with, a, I think, a definitive version of uh, their data in RDF. But uh, currently, this is not available. Yeah, um, for the time being, we are going to use it for authentication. But uh, on the long term, the same information you can find in the fourth uh, description of a user maybe can be found in ORCID. It's just a matter of changing a Sparkle query, yes. selecting a different endpoint, and so on. Any other question? Thank you very much. Paolo, I think it's your time. Is it okay? Cause so? Okay. So let me introduce uh, um, a parallel topic to uh, vocabularies and terms, uh, thesauri. Uh, what I would like uh, to introduce uh, is the um, problem of geographic names. And so something related uh, to georeferencing and uh, geography. Well, the general framework, uh, the motivation we now we all know is that uh, semantic technologies can foster interoperability, discovery, reuse of data and knowledge. Within the ecological sciences, uh, we discussed it uh, this morning and also this afternoon, the Zori, uh, have um, definitions of concept uh, uh, written by authoritative um, entities. And uh, we uh, came to this kind of uh, technologies for 
resolving some issues highlighted in the past. Here is a um, citation from the work of uh, Simon Sue and Cox, where they uh, highlighted these four issues, main issues, regarding uh, vocabularies managed with uh, spreadsheets, uh, databases, uh, and so on. These are ambiguity, inconsistent governance, uh, lack of modularity, uh, lack of interoperability, and uh, specifically the use of local identifiers and not uh, unique and persistent identifiers. And uh, to go through more in detail, ambiguity could be related to the problem of concepts uh, poorly defined. Uh, inconsistent governance, uh, for example, is uh, raised, raises from uh, same terms uh, in multiple vocabularies uh, without uh, um, relations among them. The lack of modularity, well, this is, uh, for, for my discourse, uh, is a, a bit uh, questionable uh, point, but uh, disciplines uh, need not only the, um, the terms, uh, talking about vocabularies, the terms of their own discipline and vocabularies they are governing by themselves, uh, but also they need to use uh, uh, terms and vocabularies uh, from other disciplines. Well, non-interoperability and the uh, problem of identifier, uh, I just uh, told you what I was thinking about. The point is, these same issues apply, apply also to geographic names. Well, geographic names uh, are a way uh, especially historically, to uh, do some georeference. So uh, you could have uh, historical collections. Uh, this is, uh, um, I don't know the English for uh, cartellino. No, 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 but the cartellino. Uh, label, OK. <laughs> label of the historical collection. Uh, it reports uh, Monte Salomone, that is uh, a toponym. So the geographic information is stored within that label. And uh, um, uh, authorable authors uh, speak about uh, the, the, the point that um, named places describe, uh, for example, areas. And there is uncertainty when uh, someone collects uh, some observation, use a toponym, the toponym uh, have uh, also uncertainty um, uh, with uh, its usage. And, um, well, geographic names uh, could be intended in this sense for historic uh, tradition and But they are not only historically used for metadata. One point, well, to solve the problem of, for example, uncertainty and so on, could be that of use coordinates, geometries, something more similar to what we intend with geographic features in uh, OGC sense. And these features could be provided by WFS, Web Feature Services. Let me examine this uh, WFS solution in relation to the issues uh, I mentioned earlier. For what regard ambiguity, my opinion is that this ambiguity problem could not be so well solved. Because, for example, the same geography, the same uh, geometry uh, referenced uh, uh, with a reference system could uh, indicate uh, different places. Because, for example, you could have Sicily, the administrative region, that is different from the island Sicily. They are two different 
concept. For inconsistent governance, how could we relate with WFS technology, different um, WFS servers defining the same uh, geometries? This is also um, an issue because if you have attributes within the WFS, you can have some attributes in one WFS, other attributes for the same feature in another one, and then you have to rely on the geographic representation of the feature to uh, assert that these features are the same, and so the feature have these properties and also the other properties. Well, the modularity problem, I told you that uh, I'm not so sure about my assertion, but, um, well, WFS in a uh, service-oriented architecture like that uh, promoted by OGC could be not such a problem. But a solution for um, enabling users of WFS, separate WFS, also from other discipline, disciplines, could be that uh, represented by national job portals, which collect uh, several uh, information layers from different disciplines. But in this case, it is not always true that this other issue of non-persistent identifiers is resolved. As an example, we encountered uh, in uh, our work um, this problem within our national job portal because the IDs of the features were not unique and also not only unique uh, uh, within, th they are not uh, unique uh, neither within the same uh, information layer because uh, um, the, the, the server is programmed uh, in order to generate the, um, the IDs uh, at each request. So if you have a request, uh, a certain paging of the features retrieved, uh, you have uh, again uh, one, two, three, four for the IDs. So it is another problem because on the contrary, you could use uh, the get feature by ID request uh, to attribute a URI to a certain feature within a national job portal. Well, for governance and persistent identifica identification, um, a possible solution, a strategy for a possible solution is um, represented as an example by the marine gazetteer of marine regions where you have this gazetteer um, which attributed uh, IDs, uh, unique IDs to features that um, are um, retrievable within this gazetteer and with the feature you can also get all or some WFS servers which have information for that specific feature. Here the problem is uh, with this uh, MRG ID. Well, it is, uh, I found the two issues. The lack for a URI to identify the features because uh, you have a uh, REST. Um, well, the, the MRG ID is a way to call the service uh, and have information, but it is questionable, well, it is not a URI, it is just a, a numeric identifier, but it is uh, not clear which URI could be used uh, ending with that MRG ID to uniquely identifying uh, the, the feature. Also, the WFS, which are linked uh, to this feature, uh, often have no um, uh, standard structure. So you can have uh, several ways to individuate the, um, uh, the attribute column, let me <laughs> see that, um, where this ID is stored. Well, the proposal, our proposal finally, is 
um, to use semantic geographic features. There are several ontologies or schemas, RDF schemas, to describe geographic features. For example, SCOS. Uh, an example is the SCOS Gazetteer in the uh, NERC uh, vocabulary server, that is uh, C19. The Sweet Ontology is uh, a work uh, by a group coordinated by NASA, and um, it defines uh, realms, uh, which are definition of uh, feature types uh, in a certain way. Geolink, that is uh, a ongoing initiative uh, in the United States um, is also defining uh, a new ontology and uh, they also consider geographic features. Our choice uh, and our proposal uh, to be discussed of course is to exploit GeoNames ontology that has uh, um, a certain maturity and uh, there are prominent examples of a gazetteer exploiting this uh, ontology. Geonames.org uh, is uh, a big project uh, for a gazetteer, uh, word gazetteer. They expose as a linked data and uh, RDF representation of their features. Uh, the RDF graph is downloadable even if uh, there is no SparkQL endpoint. Other experiences uh, are uh, the Gang Gazetteer. Uh, there is also, I, I didn't um, cite it, it uh, but uh, a, a work from uh, some colleagues of us, uh, of uh, CNR in Italy, that uh, exploited uh, geonames uh, for uh, um, uh, geographic features representation. Well, our own, uh, ongoing work in LifeWatch uh, Italy is to the transformation of Italian toponyms uh, from the uh, IGM, that is the, uh, institute, uh, the, the military institute uh, of uh, geography, yeah. um, into geonames ontology. Okay, why geonames? Uh, I just told uh, something. I go through uh, just some something. There are uh, mappings to other ontologies, uh, and this could be really important, in my opinion, to reuse other uh, ontologies. So we are reusing geonames, but also geonames uh, uh, exploits uh, uh, well-established uh, ontologies and schemas. There are hierarchies and relations, uh, as it is required by uh, a structure for a gazetteer, but these hierarchies and relations are specifically geographic, so it's it makes uh, sense to use this kind of representation. And also, uh, it is multilingual. It's RDF and it's multilingual. Why using uh, semantic resources? Well, one use case could be for historical observation. Um, another one could be to merge synonyms, uh, also with respect to this first uh, problem. Another one could be uh, that, uh, the, uh, here I am introducing something uh, that uh, is a bit uh, out of topic, but in the um, observations and measurements uh, model, you have a feature of interest, uh, and it is uh, really important that uh, different observations refers to a URI identifying a feature of interest, because uh, I could be interested in having information that is uh, um, distributed in the internet uh, about a specific feature, if the feature of interest are um, identified using URIs uh, universally, then I could uh, uh, take information about uh, my feature of my interest from separate sources. Uh, again, why use uh, semantic resources and go, go why should I go back to toponyms? And uh, it, that it seems uh, a, an old uh, strategy to georeference. Another example that uh, I found uh, fascinating <laughs> uh, is offered by uh, this uh, picture. Uh, this was um, 
uh, an installation at the Venice Biennale uh, exposition the last year and uh, this machinery uh, traced in real time outputs uh, in, as you can see uh, in real time the movable border between Italy and Austria because these borders are defined according to some geographic, I, I think it's uh, about uh, something uh, of a uh, glacier or uh, so given that the, this ge geographic uh, feature is evolving, also are the administrative feature. And so, in my opinion, it could uh, um, make us think that places uh, are something more than geographic representation. They are something more like concepts in the uh, analogy with Tesori. Well, uh, the, the last motivation for our work is that uh, existing authoritative sources must be preserved and leveraged. And this uh, case uh, of the official IGM uh, Italian toponyms uh, is, of course, authoritative. It has a, a long history. And uh, it is currently available as uh, within a WFS on the National uh, Geo Portal. So we uh, started this work of transforming this kind of representation into geonames ontology, starting with uh, the, the, the attributes of these toponyms. These attributes uh, have the peculiarity uh, to be um, defined by feature attribute coding catalog uh, that is uh, also at the ba basis of geonames uh, feature classes um, and the feature codes, uh, even if uh, with uh, several uh, transformations. Uh, they have also inclusion of, um, well, the um, administrative inclusion. So each point has also the, the, the code of the region, of the city. So something can be constructed also with respect to semantic relations. There are uh, about uh, 100 categories based on this uh, FACP. So we tried to map uh, these categories uh, to feature codes and feature classes. Um, the result is that among uh, about uh, 100 uh, categories, we could not map 27 of them, uh, that is uh, about, uh, I think, uh, one, one tenth of the whole uh, toponyms. Seven categories that have multiple corresponding geonames, codes, or geonames uh, feature classes, and nine categories uh, were mapped uh, to four feature codes. Work done was also an initial XSLT transformation to map the, um, this um, material, this, the, the, these points, uh, into geonames. And uh, we have this plan for the, the future, the next future, that is store the complete RDF representation within a test uh, triple store, possibly enabling GeoSparkle functionality. We are uh, using uh, Fuseki for uh, this matter. Uh, parallelly store geonames.org RDF that is huge and uh, we partly did this within uh, again a two second point and then mapping IGM toponyms uh, to geonames.org toponyms uh, it is matching the toponyms uh, in order to find uh, or to contribute to geonames uh, or to find uh, matches that could be useful and <coughs> in the end uh, use the obtained resources for tests uh, in other applications uh, relevant to historical biodiversity collections but also as it was uh, talking about it uh, Cristiano uh, within the infrastructure of the uh, Ritmare project uh, I think it could be of some usefulness well future perspective could be that of semantic uh, semantically driven discovery, 
So in this uh, Google-like uh, uh, manner, uh, one could um, express the, um, this kind of search, find phytoplankton observations in oligotrophic lakes uh, within alpine region, and also, uh, this is the, the argument I used uh, before, um, is to use these semantic toponyms uh, for features of interest of observation and measurements uh, model. Thank you. Thank you, Paolo. For I don't know how to close it. <laughs> Are you meaning that with uh, global warming uh, we are going to be one country with Austria? about the that in in biology all changes and also the the border of the countries changes okay and uh, the last uh, yes the last uh, presentation is uh, from uh, Nikos If you can help me find it, because it's the next generation, I think, but I'm not in the next generation yet. <laughs> okay, okay, thank you. So, I'm going to present you. Uh, the work that we've done in Lavgos, Greece, regarding the data service, the semantic data service of the infrastructure. The main pillars of this work of Lavgos, Greece, in, in, in general, are the statistical R parallelization virtual laboratory, the micro CT services of the infrastructure, and this one, the semantic data services. Uh, I was the coordinator of these actions, so uh, if you have any question, please interrupt interrupt me. Uh, I think it will be better for the flow of the presentation. So at first I will show you the problem that we wanted to solve apart from the uh, Live Goes Greece project. It was just a, or an opportunity to solve it. Uh, also the goal that we have as a team, the idea to solve this problem, a preparatory phase uh, that was a, a long phase that took place before the design and implementation of the data services, the semantic models that we, that we used, the data services that we implemented. Then I will spend uh, some time uh, in showing an example that will make clear to you what exactly we did and some conclusions. So what was the problem? I think that you, are, uh, you all are more or less familiar with it. Is the cross-disciplinary character of the biodiversity data. So. Uh, biodiversity data includes a broad range of data types, of data structures, and of concepts. And all these, most of the time, are widely distributed and unconnected. So we can have identification records of species in Excel format in University of Salonica, and these are all uh, real examples. We can have occurrence uh, records in files in University of Patra, microset images in the Hellenic uh, Center of marine research, etc. And our goal is to give our users the possibility, was actually because the project ended last week, uh, to give our users the possibility to support the cataloging and the publishing of this data, to also integrate data that comes mostly from heterogeneous sources by using the semantic models that we've uh, 
uh, developed or extended and to give our users the possibility to discover efficiently data of interest, to be able to answer uh, complex queries that cannot be answered by the individual sources, and to also keep the provenance of the data. In other words, we want to connect everything together and to give the possibility to the scientists or the citizens uh, to retrieve this data. The idea was the following. Uh, usually, a data set of the biodiversity domain contains uh, a lot of information about different biodiversity events. So, for example, an expedition data set may contain information about identification of species, about occurrences of species, naming events, specimen creation events, even measurement events. So, the idea was to extract this information from the events that are uh, included either explicitly or implicitly in the biodiversity data sets, then to model all these concepts and entities by using our semantic models and to take advantage of the um, uh, browsing that the semantic graphs, that the semantic graph allows. So I will tell you just a few words about the preparatory phase, but it was a long phase. It lasted more than one year. So the main bullets are that uh, we collected and analyzed a great number of biodiversity data sets. We also collected and analyzed more than 50 competency queries that are uh, uh, um, real queries that come from the community and express the main scientific questions that we want to answer. So, for example, give me uh, all the species that have been occurred in the Mediterranean Sea in the 19th century. And, yes, we, we asked we, uh, we asked the experts from the uh, partner uh, institutions of Greece, so they got back to us with the questions that they wanted to answer. And then we expressed them in SparkQL, and we tried to answer them. But of course, we don't answer just these 50 competency queries. This was uh, our starting point. So we identified also 12 main metadata categories that can cover the whole Greek biodiversity domain. For example, identification uh, metadata is one category. Occurrence metadata is another. Micro CT scanning metadata is the third one. All this information is online, so you can access it later. But it's 300 pages. So. Yeah. I will, get, I will get to it in my, in my next slide. So we also selected and extended semantic models. So we used some semantic models that are there already, and I will show you in the next slide, and extended them in order to cover the expressi expressivity power that we wanted. Afterwards, we created schema mappings using uh, a new mapping language that was developed in fourth. It's called DEX3ML. And we also have a lot of components, such as the schema matcher, the schema mapper, uh, the, transform the transformer of the data. Uh, I didn't know that there would, be, there would be so much discussion on the schema mappings. Uh, otherwise, I would have included a slide, but we can talk later on it. And we identified the fundamental categories that are, are the main disjoint categories that cover the whole biodiversity domain. And I have an example in my next slide. This is also an example of the modeling examples that we created for every uh, metadata category. This has to do with uh, micro CT scanning. So to also answer to your question, we have developed in fourth for now, now for 20 years a model that was meant to cover the cultural heritage domain and has also been an ISO for this domain. It's called SIDOC CRM but it's built in a philosophical way that it can cover almost everything that has to do with the data sciences. Uh, you can search for it or I can give you more information on it. So in order to also cover uh, our two main uh, uh, goals, the scientific observation and measurement, we extended it in CRM Scientific. And in, in order to cover the biodiversity domain, we extended marine TLO, which is a top-level ontology that was built in the context 
of five marine project to cover the marine domain, we extended to also cover the terrestrial one. So these are the only models, the only standard that we used or extended. All the other standards can be mapped to these uh, models by using our mapping technologies. So the product of this phase was a prototypical three components architecture. So in order to achieve these goals, we have to build an architecture that consists of three main components, the directory service, the metadata repository, and the coded storage. In the directory service, we keep uh, domain independent information that has to do with the data sets itself. So information on where are the data sets stored, how to access them, or whom should I communicate to in order to access them. And this is domain independent. So it can be applied in every domain except the biodiversity one. Then we have the metadata repository that stores all the domain dependent information. So the, the information about the biodiversity events is being stored there. And we have the code and storage that stores the raw data and it's optional to store it. We don't focus in raw data in Largos Greece. We focus in the metadata. Uh, we also developed more than 20 web services that have to do with publishing of metadata and data, searching, discovering of metadata and data, browsing services, mapping services, transformation and annotation services. So uh, there was a presentation before about the morphological characteristics annotation. This is exactly what it does. We are using the Polytrace database of Lagos Greece and we annotate our species with morphological characteristics. And we also have the web application uh, that is hosted in the Live was Greece portal and you can all register and find out what functionalities we offer. Also the code for all these is available online, online in GitHub and the services are deployed in, in our infrastructure in Crete. It consists of more than uh, 500,000 of uh, code lines. So let's go to the example. If you browse the Live was Greece portal, or this URL, then the data services is what I'm presenting right now. We give a lot of capabilities to our users, but I will focus on the publishing and on the searching of data. So they can publish uh, their metadata about the data set that is stored in the directory service by either uploading a template that they have, and we offer them in order to do so, or by filling a form. Uh, except from the main metadata like the creation date of the data set, the publication date and the access of the data set, we focused a lot in the human factor. Because if you store only the information on where something is stored and how to access it, then your information is incomplete. It's more important to have the information on whom to talk when the uh, data sets are not available. So we have information about the owner, the curator, the contributors, the publishers, the creators, the right holders, and the number of metadata about it. So after the users have completed this form, their data sets have been published in a way. But they can also download some templates and fill them in order to give us more information about uh, the events that are described in these data sets. And then they can upload this information by using the data set metadata tab. And they can also optionally upload their data set. After all these steps, the information has been transformed uh, in RDF and has been stored uh, in a virtuoso trip store. We are now migrating in a bla in Blaze Graph. I don't know if anyone else is working uh, with Blaze Graph right now. It's a kind of uh, new trend and it's faster and more scalable. So now regarding the searching functionalities, we give a simple search on the directory. So a search on the metadata of the data sets. In this example, I don't know if you can uh, read it, uh, I'm asking for data sets that come from the Hellenic Center of Marine Resources. And then I take back a full list of data sets. Right now we have uh, almost 200 of them. And you can see the metadata that we keep. You can download the data set if it is online and you have permission to do so. And by clicking on more info, you take information, as I told you, about the contact point, the access method, the description of the data set and the whole group of metadata. But this wasn't enough because as a researcher, I don't want to download a full list of data sets. 
and then access these data sets to see if the information that they have inside is what I'm uh, searching for in order to complete my research. I, I have a very specific question in my mind. For example, I need to find uh, information about the occurrence of species in the Mediterranean Sea. For all the different metadata categories, we have a different uh, set of metadata that we are using and we are giving to our, our users the capabilities to ask. So if I perform this query, then what I take back is not a list of data set, but is an aggregation of all the events that are included in different data sets coming from different providers. So all of these are just occurrence events. The aggregation of the whole of all the occurrence events that we are storing in the infrastructures. Let's suppose that the user is interested in um, occurrence of polyculus or radiacus in Greece. If he clicks in the more info, he takes back more information about the event, such as the scientists that perform it, uh, Panagiotis Damianidis, the specific place, uh, along with coordinates of this place, and some other metadata that are relevant to this event. Uh, if you notice, we have a lot of links. These are not links to the external sources or to external resources. These are links to the nodes of the semantic graph that has been created. So if you click any of this, then you will browse to the graph and you will find all the, insa uh, you will find all the incoming and outgoing nodes to and from this node. So if we suppose that the scientist is interested in the specific animal that was found during this event and clicks on it, he takes back information about the specific animals such as the uh, species that it belongs and also all the other events that it participated in, that it, it participated. For example, an identification event of this species took place in Kithira, an occurrence event also. And let's suppose that the user is interested in this, in the transformation event of this animal into a specimen. By clicking on the URI, okay, this is the label, but if you click it, then it uses the URI and you can uh, browse the graph. He takes back information about this event and he finds out that it was transformed by Martina Nicolopoulou uh, into a specimen. So Martina Nicolopoulou killed it and then preserved it in ethanol and he took another ID, which is the micro CT 00047 uh, uh, ID. And by clicking on it, you also take back information about the scanning event and you, by clicking on the view data set, the download data set, you download images about this animal. So the scientist started from a very general question. He was able to find the data sets that are uh, relevant to the question that he, uh, that he had in his mind. And then he also discovered knowledge that he didn't even knew that was there from the first place. We also have this uh, very generic searching mechanism by using the fundamental category. So we've classified everything as an actor or a dimension uh, or uh, an event or a time or a thing. And then we have all the properties that can relate these things together. So if a user that doesn't know about the biodiversity domain, doesn't know what the semantics that we are using or the terms that we are using, can express very generic questions such as find all the actors that have met Greece. If you apply this query, then you will take back all the scientists that you have in the database and that have uh, observed species in Greece or identified species in Greece or performed uh, DNA sequencing or micro CT uh, scanning in Greece. And then by clicking on the uh, label, you can continue the browsing as I already showed you. We have another service that you provide the scientific name of a species and then all the information that we have in our databases is being aggregated. We are using some specific templates, so it is returned to the user as a natural language description, as a Wikipedia entry. Uh, obviously, we take uh, advantage of the syntax of RDF that is common with uh, most of the languages that we are using. So then you can... Uh, read all the information that you have in your graph. The Alburnus sesaliscus species belongs to this genus, has been found uh, by Stefanidis in 1950, etc., etc. And by clicking on the links, you can browse again the semantic graph. So, uh, also we have some new recovery mechanisms in order to recover all the infrastructure if uh, something is corrupted. 
Uh, we have uh, functions that update semantic graphs. All these are prototypical. We have the browsing service, the annotation service that I already told you. We also have the data refinement service uh, in cooperation with BioVel people from uh, Manchester and our public endpoints. And just to conclude, uh, it was the first biodiversity fully semantic tech based infrastructure, what we built. Uh, we found out and applied, and it also has been adopted by a number of uh, new European project, uh, projects, a new prototypical architecture for science. Uh, we have an efficient data discovery mechanism. We exploited the deductions and implicit knowledge. We implemented a number, a significant number of web services, semantic models, and these services. And we kept an innovative character and a cross disciplinary interest. So, all these are references to some publications and to the GitHub. If the, publication, if the presentation goes online, you can browse them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Questions or comments? Yeah. And what is it that you get all the pages of the students or something? No. About the data, do you have uh, only data about the occurrence? I mean, yes or no, is present or no, uh, at temporal and special scale, or also abundance uh, and other uh, data. Uh, in terms of biodiversity, uh, the domain of biodiversity, starting from, uh, I don't know, phytoplankton until uh, mammals, or only a specific domain? Do you have this kind of We don't have only occurrence records. We have uh, uh, that have to do with the absence or not of a specific species in a place. We also have, as you, as you said, information about abundance. So we have statistical information. We have morphometrics, morphometrics and morphological information. And we cover the whole uh, biodiversity domain of Greece. So we have all the species, uh, at least we can cover all the species that come from Greece. Of course, we don't have all the metadata of Greece right now, but uh, we hope so. Just to answer your question, uh, we are using uh, Virtuoso, and uh, right now we are using. We want to use the TBD, the Triposterovagina, because it is Sparkle 1.1 compliant. Uh, and the question is uh, the Triposter you were mentioning before. Your answer is if Blaze Graph. Is uh, ah you just wanted the name? Yes. It's called Blaze. It is yes, it definitely is. It's Blaze Graph. I can send you a link later. It's Blaze Graph. Uh, it is uh, developed by Metafax, I think, and it's the new thread. So uh, if you see all the new uh, European projects uh, of infrastructure such as Parthenos or VRE for ARC, they are using Blaze Graph, or they tend to use Blaze Graph. And the first, the first experimental results that we have are very promising. Because Virtuoso has a lot of problems, and uh, you know, uh, regarding scalability and regarding performance, I think uh, Blaze Graph is uh, better uh, by far. But what Blaze Graph doesn't have as the, at the moment is the community of Virtuoso and also their graphical user interfaces. Jenna has, so Jenna has the Sparkle, um, progressing with the Sparkle versions and the GeoSparkle one, um, but uh, yeah, if, if we'll search about Blazegraph, yeah. So what kind of uh, format file a user uh, can upload? Uh, there are metadata about the data sets. Uh, are uploaded by the form that I already showed you or by a template that we are giving to them. All the others are specific CSV files 
that the users are feeling in Darwin Core. Because, but this is because that's what they selected in the content of uh, LiveGos Greece. Uh, the tools that we have don't care about the format of data that they take as input. Because we recently made a small research about triple stores, um, and we saw that they all have a commercial element that was crucial to the performance. So they said that you can publish up to 500 million triples, and that's it. And then after that, you need to buy the software. So what about Blazegraph? The commercial version was has, had also to do with the distribution of the... So if you wanted to build a federated system, then you also had to pay. A Blazegraph is completely free, at least at the moment. A uh, uh, commercial thing about what? About your question, about uh, I mean about the amount of data that you can store and the federated version, it's free, yes. I don't know if they have a commercial uh, version for something else, but for those two aspects, it's free. And this is also a uh, reason that, that we want to use it. But I don't, I don't know uh, what uh, uh, size of data are you using, because we've tested it up to one billion triples. Yes. Yes. Ah, it will increase, yeah. Mm. <laughs> at least at the moment it's free, but you know when it will come it will become more popular, it's possible that they will ask for they will ask for licenses. Yes, but all the other stores they said that they have a limited conversion on really good Yeah. Yes. And they have like extra uh Virtuoso doesn't have a limit, but if you use the free edition and you try to load more than one hu or 100 million triples, it doesn't work. So. Mm. Okay, thank you. Uh, you talked about the CDOC uh, CRM. Uh, when you decide to use this framework, this uh, methodology, have you compared it with uh, other uh, approach like uh, Oboe or uh, Seronto that Barbara uh, presented today? And why you decide to use it? It was compared before me starting, in, uh, before the involvement of me in the, sp in the project, so I cannot give you many details. But the main difference is that SIDOC uh, CRM is an event centric model and uh, observation or measurements are events. So it's more flexible and uh, it makes sense to use it instead of OBOE, for example. There is a comparison of OBOE and CDOC CRM and a paper that has been published, but I have to search to give you more information on this. Thank you. More question, no. Um, I don't know if uh, Anna, you hear me? Because Anna? Because if you don't have a um, possibility to, to Anna, you hear me? Yes, I am here. Yes, okay. I, I hear you. Okay, okay. If if you want to speak about uh, your your work or uh, or something. Or, or to uh, have a, a, a general introduction about uh, your uh, your your site or your work. We have a, um, a, a lot of minutes uh, to to, to we, we before the the coffee break, and before the the, the discussion in the, in the afternoon. If you want, uh, you have a time for 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 for, for introduce you and uh, uh, your work or. Again, we go to take a coffee. Uh, so it's up to you. It doesn't mean I'm very impressed uh, due to your effort, to this kind of studies at all. Uh, and of course, uh, I am very interested in such kind of studies, uh, mainly as um, provider of this kind of data and, of course, user. It doesn't mean, uh, uh, 
we we are very interested in uh, building, preparing special kind of database, uh, and we want to be able to interpret this data in the same way, to be able to compare uh, different situations in different countries uh, or due to different species. Uh, so uh, I wasn't familiar uh, to, to, to this kind of studies uh, as you uh, have shown the results of your uh, activity at all. Uh, so for me, it is really very huge uh, lecture at all, and uh, mm, at all, uh, I, I think uh, rather, uh, uh, I will have maybe more questions or comments, but rather in the end of this workshop. So maybe I will uh, prepare something uh, like uh, a list of, of, of this kind of question uh, due to my own interest in uh, forest ecology and uh, at all invasion uh, ecology of wooden species. So do you agree with me? Yeah, thank you. Anna, the, 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 yeah, we, we can discuss uh, after or uh, in the round table uh, of uh, tomorrow because we have uh, a lot of points that we can discuss to, to today and, uh, and also uh, and also tomorrow uh, and I think it's uh, time for another coffee <laughs> I think thank you I think thank yeah, you thank Anna you. Outside, okay.